Marvelous Halloween fiends and loathed ones, how are you today and welcome to part two of my trick and treat Halloween special. Last time we covered the trick by looking at ghost trick phantom detective, but today I thought we'd dive into something a little bit sweeter. Pokemon Sweet version is a ROM hack of Fire Red that was created by Ephraim225 and Chanini. It was released back in 2014, and the most obvious thing you'll notice is that all of the Pokemon in this game have been turned into delicious treats called Poke Sweets. So this isn't a Snorlax you see on the title screen, it's a Smorlax. Oh, this is going to be fun. There are a grand total of 151 Poke Sweets in this game, and with this being a ROM hack of a Gen 1 remake, you'd probably think it's just the Gen 1 Pokedex, but it's not. You've got folks from Gen 2, 3, 4, 5, and even a handful from 6. And a lot of these names and designs are super cute and clever. Like Meowth being Meowfin, or instead of Zangoose, there's Flangoose, which is just flantastic. But every now and then, you run into ones like Egglove, which is... I mean, that's just Blissey, right? They hardly changed anything. But overall, yes, I think the Poke Sweets are just delightful. You've got Gummy Ursa and Gumchu as two different flavors of gummy bears, and they even did something really clever with Mr. Mime by changing its Japanese name, Barriered, to Barriered. I just love that. Even if this thing does look like it just ate the untested gum at Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. Oompa Loompa Doompa Tee Doo. I'm going to leave you inside box two. And then there's Moose. Some of these really do just write themselves. I can dig it. But what's perhaps the most impressive is they also created their own type chart. Every Poke Sweet and Move falls into at least one of the 12 flavors you'll find throughout Sweetland. You've got vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, and a bunch of other fruity flavors. Most of the flavors are just fruit. What may take a bit of getting used to is the types aren't just one-to-one -one conversions. Sure, a pie duck using Surf is a blueberry-type Poke Sweet using a blueberry move, but a Cinewag using Bubble is a chocolate-type using an apple move. Some of the moves also got renamed, like Acid becoming a banana-type move called Peeler. Basically, you have to unlearn almost everything you know about Pokémon and pretty quickly learn the ins and outs of Pokémon Sweet version's type chart. Alright, but enough talk. I'm ready to begin my adventure into the world of Poke Sweets. First, I named myself, but since this is such a delectable world, I can't just be John, so I opted to call myself John Bon. It's like a bonbon, except you can really taste the me! I also got to name my rival, and I called him Fondant, because he's ugly and makes everything about dessert worse. You start out in Cookie Village, and you can expect a lot of these chocolate browns and bright pinks in Sweetland. I head on over to Professor Sinna's lab, and she's got three Poke Sweets for myself, Mark, who is just the dude from Ruby, and Katya, who is a much more heavily edited version of May. You get to choose between Brownie Sore, a cherry chocolate type, Strawmander, a strawberry type, and Squirpie, an apple type. I went with Brownie Sore because I just thought it was the best in terms of both design and confectionery punnery. Then you've got to fight Katya and Mark back to back. Katya picks the starter that's strong against yours, while Mark picks the one weak against you. I also want to mention that when I started playing this game, I originally planned on doing this video as sort of a Nuzlocke challenge, but because of an unfortunate critical hit, I actually lost against Mark Strawmander. And seeing as how it'd probably be a bad idea to end the video here, I scrapped the Nuzlocke plan and just continued my adventure. Oh yeah, and you fight Fondant, who has a Popsichu, but Fondant is dumb and gross, so who cares? One kind of weird thing about this game is you aren't given the option to nickname your starter, but fortunately the name raider is in this game's equivalent of Viridian City. So I quickly renamed my brownie sword Duncan. Along the way, I also caught a Licorita that I named Redvine, and an Applin that... Wait... Applin? Huh? Sorry, I was thinking about something else. Yes, an Applin that I named Honeycrisp. 
As I worked my way through Flower Forest, I fought a few bug trainers and quickly learned that most trainer battles in this game are double battles, with only a few exceptions. Before getting to the first gym, I also caught a Popsichu of my own, and instead of naming her after a brand or a type of orange, since it's an orange type, I named her Liz, after the lead singer's stage name from the band Freeze Pop. Oh, Freeze Pop. You got me through some tough times. Once I got into Pudding City, instead of heading straight to the gym, I wanted to explore all the buildings, and it turns out the museum is currently under attack by Team Sour. So I fight off a bunch of them, have a showdown with one of their admins, Wilfred, and even trounce fondant on my way out for good measure. Now I'm ready for the first gym leader. Unlike most gym leaders in Pokemon, Beryl does something kinda cool. Rather than specializing in a specific type, he has one Pokemon from each type of the three starters, and his team is built around his nickname of him being the Jawbreaker, cause his Poke Sweets are all tough to bite. Oh yeah, also, Poison in this game was changed to the Hunger status, and the Poke Sweets literally eat themselves. It's kinda messed up. Also, G, changing something that was already established to Hunger. Where, oh where, have I heard that before? So after getting my first badge, Duncan evolved into Chocosaur, and I headed on over to the Candy Mine, where I caught myself a Q-Pop, because just look at this thing! Yaw. Welcome to the team, Tootsie! And Team Sour is up to their old trick, so I've gotta fight Wilfred again. And I have no idea what type of move Slice is, but it sliced through most of my team with super effective damage, so this fight was actually kinda tough. But I won, and Redvine evolved into Leafarish. You also don't get any fossils, because both of Gen 1's fossil Pokémon, Mintonite and Lemiod, are actually found in this cave. As for Aerodactyl, eh, it's not in this game. I mean, what would it even be? Aerodactyl? Eventually, I get to Orange City and have another friendly match against Mark and Katya, who apparently traded starters with one another at some point, which is super weird. I don't... I don't think that was supposed to happen. Anyway, I get to fight the second gym leader, Fizzy, who specializes in orange flavor Poke Sweets. Luckily for me, orange is weak against both cherry and apple, so Duncan and Honeycrisp help get me through most of it. There's even a super cute reference in this gym from a swimmer named Kel. Who loves orange soda? That is just delightful. And then a super awkward OJ Simpson reference. That is... Much less delightful. But I end up beating Fizzy and getting my second badge, so now it's time to head south to Meringue City and board the cruise ship, the SS Banana. I got a lot of good training done on this ship, so much so that Honeycrisp evolved into Swalapple. This is also where the game gets kinda weird. On the ship, you meet up with a talking Poke Sweet named Chocobun, who tells you that she created all of Sweetland. And then we get attacked by pirates. Also, this dude wants to write a love letter to Chocobun, cause I'm- er, he's, um... You know, this is the second video I've done this year where I've had to ask myself what the food equivalent of a furry is. Before heading into this gym, I caught a Banvi that I named Gro Michel, which I'm only just now realizing I spelled wrong, so... Let's- let's just ignore that. Also, it immediately evolved into a Banvine. I'm just now realizing this is the third Poke Sweet on my team based on a grass starter. I just wanted to grab it to help me out for the gym leaders Ban and Lem, who specialize in banana and lemon Pokemon respectively. These two types are weak against each other, but both types are equally weak to orange, so Liz and I made sure their team effort quickly backfired. Backfired is a song by Freeze Pop. Oh yeah, and Tootsie evolved into Lollywhack. So, one thing I quickly want to mention about this game that I probably should have mentioned earlier is it does something very unique with gyms. For one, most of the time, once you enter a gym, you're not allowed to leave until you either beat the leader or lose. I don't really like this very much. The other thing that I do like is you're free to challenge the gym leaders as many times as you want, and this actually makes them a really great way to train. Except for some reason you can't repeat the last two gyms, you know, the ones I'd actually want to train in. But this is still so much better than just knocking out wild Poke Sweets that are like 10 levels lower than you. 
So I used my brain power to hatch a harebrained scheme and told Liz to get ready to rock because we're gonna fight Ban and Lem until she gets to level 32 and evolves into a ricicle. I should probably stop with the freeze pop jokes. Hypothetically speaking. You've probably noticed by now how closely this game follows the main plot, so you'd think our next stop would be Rock Tunnel, or Cake Tunnel as it's known in Sweetland. And we totally can do that, or we can actually skip it entirely, because the Smorlax blocking our path to the east of Meringue City is one tile down, so you can actually enter Candy Village from the bottom if you want. And if you do want to go through Cake Tunnel, which I did just to fight trainers and catch new Poke Sweets like Kangas Cake, you don't even need Flash, which I really appreciated. What I didn't appreciate was that while making your way to Rainbow City, you have another back-to-back -back fight against Mark and Katya, and you don't even get healed in between them. Most of my team was fainted by the time I got to Katya, and I had to use up all my revives. But thanks to a combination of life-draining cherry seeds with Liz's ability to paralyze, I was eventually able to beat both of them, and Duncan finally evolved into Fudgesaur. I also ran into Fondant in the Rainbow Game Corner, but he didn't fight me. Instead, he gave me a coin case, and as I went into the basement expecting to go through the Team Sour hideout, it's just a secret underground gambling den, and I gave this guy a thousand coins to get the HM for strength. I also decided to tackle the gym while I was here, and it's this pitch black gym where all the ladies specialize in lime flavor poke sweets. Except for this one girl who uses the brownie sore line. Don't know what her deal is. But thanks to Grow Michelle evolving into Benperior and Lime being weak to Banana, I beat Keela pretty easily. And then realized since there was no Team Sour Base under the casino, I should probably backtrack to the Pokemon Tower. Which in this game isn't a graveyard, but a candy factory! We get to see our buddy Fondant again and utterly destroy him, cause I'm super overleveled after training to beat Keela. I make my way through a bunch of sour grunts, most of whom only have one Poke Suite, and finally fight... Wilfred again. Does this organization not have any other admins? Whatever, I beat him and he questions the validity of raising your Poke Suites using only rare candies, much like a young me did when he discovered the item duplication glitch in Pokemon Blue version. And then this old guy gives us a birthday cake so we can finally wake up the sleeping Smorlax. So I... Do that, and catch it. Look, what do you want from me? That's just what happened! And while I totally considered adding Smorlax to my team, I even named him Stay Puffed, I've already got six Poke Sweets, and it's a chocolate vanilla type, both of which I already have in Duncan and Liz, so into the box with you. I quickly glide down Strawberry Slope and arrive in Berry City, and the first thing I want to do is check out the Safari Zone which is called the Black Forest. Now, in this game, rather than paying to get in and having a limited amount of time, you can just run around and catch things as you see fit. What I really like about this is it's divided into four holiday-themed sections, like Christmas, Easter, Halloween, and Valentine's Day. And the Poke Suites you encounter reflect these holidays, like finding Cornette in the Halloween section. Even though I already have an awesome orange type in Liz, I super considered using this thing in my party, cause, you know, this is a Halloween video, he's a candy corn, but then, thanks to a battle in the Black Forest against Hex Maniac Tharja, yep, I saw that Cornet evolves into, just like, it's Bayonet, but it's wearing a pumpkin suit, and it loses all the fun candy corn aesthetic it once had, so... screw that. I made my way to the secret house, but this guy can't give me my prize because it was stolen by the pirates I fought back in Meringue City. Eventually I beat them up, even taking down their leader, which allowed Redvine to evolve into Leganium. And just like the real Meganium, this seems like a major downgrade from its middle stage. I get that it's supposed to look more like an actual licorice flower rather than licorice candy, but how can Redvine be Redvine without any red vines? So anyway, I get back the HM for Surf, and it's in that moment that I realize... I've made a huge mistake. See, I guess I wasn't really thinking about it, since there is no water or flying type in this game, but none of my Poke Sweets can learn Surf or Fly. So I decide I need to retool my team just a little bit. 
fortunately for me, I actually caught a Poke Sweet back in Cake Tunnel that can learn both Fly and Surf, and that Poke Sweet is... Panfisk. It's like Stunfisk, only pancakes. Which I do love conceptually, but for some reason it's a pure grape type. Grapes are one of the last fruits that come to mind when I think about pancakes. You know what fruits I do picture? Bananas and blueberries, which coincidentally are what Fly and Surf are in this game. So, I make the tough decision to swap out beloved team member Tootsie for Panfisk. I teach it both HMs and fly to the name raider to change his name to Bisquick. Welcome aboard, short stack. He's a little underleveled, but as luck would have it, Berry City is where I grab the experience share, so he'll catch up in no time. But for real, why can a stack of pancakes learn surf and fly? Who'd want to surf on pancakes? They're gonna get all soggy. This is actually one of my biggest pet peeves with this ROM hack. Their decisions for who can and can't learn certain moves are needlessly confusing. Redvine is a raspberry lime flavor poke sweet, and serendipitously, Strength and Cut are a raspberry and lime move, respectively, which would have been awesome to get stabbed from. But for some reason, Redvine is unable to learn Strength, even though almost every other member of my team can. Real Meganium can learn it, why can't this line? Also, here are six poke sweets. I want you to guess which of these can learn Fly. If you guessed all of them, you're wrong. If you guessed all of them except the one with wings, you're right. Yeah, I get that some of these might be references to things such as Moose flying like one of Santa's reindeer or Squirpie being a nod to Gamera, but come on. Surf was especially tricky because it seems so random who can actually learn it. Some Poke Sweets whose original forms could learn Surf still can, like Squirpie, Cinewag, and even ones like Kangaskake, even though they won't get stabbed from it in this game. But others like Lollipop, Bananos, and Ferment can't. Perhaps the most confusing is that the Oshicone line, which is based on a water type, and is a blueberry type that would get stabbed from Surf, can't learn it, but slightly different shade of blue metatite totally can. Okay, sorry about the rant, I'm just... I'm a little salty about losing Tootsie, okay? The gym leader of Barry City is... Barry, and it's not even like Barry with an A, but he might be my favorite gym leader in this game. Why? Yo, listen up, here's the story. I was a little worried about this fight because Blueberry is only weak against Lime and Strawberry. I don't have any strawberry moves, and my only lime user is Redvine, who is also part raspberry, which blueberry is super effective against. But surprisingly, this battle was super easy. Even with his Pokémon being higher level, most of them went down without any issues. The only trouble I ran into at all was at the very end when his barrier killed Redvine with a super strong counter, but by that point it was far too late for him, so hey, as they say, Daba D, Daba Die. Next, I make my way back to Grapevine, and of course Team Sour has taken control of most of the city. But I take on the Baking Dojo, and my prize for winning is both a Strawmander and a Squirpie. Pokemon Sweet version wants you to be able to completely fill out the cookbook, so I definitely appreciated this way of making sure you can get the other starters. Unfortunately, there's no breeding in this game, so if you were hoping to do a living Pokédex cookbook, you're sure all out of luck. So I get ready to take on the Sweet Factory, and there's really not a lot to say about this one. It's virtually identical to Sylphco from the main games, except at the very top, instead of the president of Sylphco, we've got to save Chocobun and her sister by once again fighting... Sour Admin Jerk. The dialogue implies this is still Wilbur, so I think John Bon is just being sassy. So, I do want to clarify something about the writing in this game. It's pretty darn good, and feels in line with a traditional Pokémon game. There are no awkward curse words and minimal spelling errors, but Grapevine's Gym is perhaps the most out-of-traditional Pokémon experience I've seen so far. The Champion Making Guy is like, yeah, teleporting puzzles suck, huh? But apparently when you beat a trainer in this one, they'll actually give you advice on where to go next. I like that. In theory, because I just brute forced the teleporters without fighting anyone. 
and I make it to the gym leader, Lavender, who is incredibly wine drunk right now. The fight is pretty easy, with the only one who gave me any trouble being her Grapepom, who can not only confuse my team, but has the Flash Fire ability, which I guess applies to orange moves in this game, since Liz's Orange Bolt is useless against him. After I win, I have Bisquick fly me back to Cookie Village, so Bisquick can surf me through Cookie Coast, and yes, it's still very weird to me that a stack of pancakes can do both of those things, but I'd be lying if I said Bisquick hadn't become a valued and beloved member of my team by this point. Much to my surprise, on my way down, I get ambushed by the pirates and thrown into the Pirate Fort, which is basically like the Cinnabar Mansion, but you have to escape from the depths rather than going into them to grab a key, which I kinda dig. As I try to leave, I get ambushed by a pirate at the door who tells me not so fast, but I wasn't expecting him, so I clicked by it too fast. The gym leader on this island is... I have no idea, because the pirates took over the gym and I've gotta fight the pirate captain, who uses raspberry flavor poke sweets. I'm a little worried, because his gym sign says he's won a hundred times and never lost a fight. Oh, but wait, we think that may be a lie. Huh, well that's a relief. Something I found really strange about the captain's team is that at level 48, he still only has a Leaferish. There are so many trainers in this game that have their Poke Sweets evolved when they shouldn't be yet, and not evolved when they totally should be. Whatever, I end up beating him and then head straight to Flower City for one final showdown with Wilfred, who is apparently a jerk because he grew up being forced to eat burgers and tacos rather than delicious sweets. I weep for you. Now, he uses vanilla types, which may seem like an odd choice for a final gym since that's basically the equivalent of normal, but at the same time, I also thought it was kind of brilliant since it doesn't have any weaknesses. But it also doesn't resist anything, so I'm able to just unleash everything I've got and take him down without much trouble. Now, when it came time for Victory Road, or Rocky Road as it's known in Pokemon Suite, it's basically the exact same layout as the main game, except, you know those annoying strength puzzles? You don't have to do those. Pokemon Suite kinda does this a lot. I definitely appreciate all the little ways it makes things a bit more convenient for the players, but it basically meant that I was able to skip over half this dungeon because I didn't have to do anything. But I'm glad I did, because in a nice twist, before you can enter Kate Castle, you have to battle against Mark and Katya one last time, who have apparently decided to rectify that confusion of switching their starters, and apparently ditched their starters entirely. Seriously, neither of them have their starters on their team. Who do they think they are? Me, in 90% of the Pokemon games I play? Mark's highest level Poke Suite is Ice Sunday, whose cherry eyes I find deeply disturbing, and Katya has apparently upgraded to an Emposh. Then my final challenge is against the Pastriots. I get it! Steve, Sarah, Sen, and most interestingly, Professor Sinna herself. I really liked this. It reminds me of that cut battle against Professor Oak from the original Pokemon games. As for their teams... There isn't really much to say, they don't seem to adhere to any specific flavor or even any sort of aesthetic theme for their teams, at least not as far as I can tell. And all of their Poke Suites are level 58, so there isn't any noteworthy ramp up in difficulty as you go through them. Fondant is there at the beginning, but apparently he's not supposed to be and he gets quickly shooed away. This game's equivalent of a champion is we have to fight Dark Chocobun who apparently believes that humans must be wiped out because they just want to eat all the Poke Sweets. I mean, sure, I'd eat Choco Bun, but not in the- The weirdest thing in this fight is that she sends herself out in battle, so you'd think after beating her, the fight would be over, but her moose is like, I guess we're still doing this. Dark Choco Bun sees the error of her ways because regular Choco Bun cries a bit, and I guess that takes care of that. I'm declared king or champion or whatever, and then the credits roll. Now, of course, there is more for me to do in this game if I really wanted to, like explore the caves where this orange cryagonal is considered a legendary for some reason, or I could go catch Mewtwo, but it has a spoon, or even catch Reginger, which is <laughs> a really clever name. I, I, I gotta hand it to them on that. There are even optional boss fights against champions from other far-off magical worlds, where instead of being made of desserts, all the Pokémon are... babies. Or clowns. Or music-based. It's... kinda weird. 
And there's even a former champion who uses a team of level 100 legendaries, and... Yeah, I think I'll stop here. Pokémon Sweet version is good. Really good. It's got a few hiccups here and there. Some of the sprites are a little awkward. I mean, just look at Bisquick's party sprite. Yikes. But there was clearly a lot of love and imagination put into this. I never encountered any horrible deal-breaking issues, or as my buddy Chet would say, bootleg blunders that made me hate the game. The only issue I ran into was sometimes, very rarely, the game would get stuck on a black screen after I left a gym, so the only thing I really advise is just save your game before you leave a gym, especially if you've been using the gyms for training and haven't saved in a while. Overall, Pokémon Suite is a pretty solid, well-built ROM hack, and the new type chart really helped make this a brand new take on a beloved franchise for me. Now, since this game came out, they've actually released a Pokémon Sweet Tooth Edition that has 386 Poké Sweets, and even added some stuff like Mega Evolutions. I haven't played that one myself, but if it's something you'd be interested in seeing me talk about on the channel, feel free to let me know in the comments. I had a blast with this game and would absolutely consider playing that one too. And so that brings us to the end of my two-part Trick and Treat Halloween special. I hope you've all enjoyed these back-to-back -back videos, and if you missed the Ghost Trick video, you can go check that out right now. If any of you are interested in playing Pokémon Sweet, I've left a link to the download for it in the description below. Thank you all for joining me for this Halloween season. I hope you all eat some delicious candy, watch a scary movie, and please, please stay safe out there. Until next time, Happy Halloween! Man, I don't know about all of you, but I am really in the mood for some baked goods right now. Dark Choco Bun was right to fear me. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, be sure to click like, but if you really liked it, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos. Extra special thanks to all my friends and loved ones over on Patreon, which you can pledge to today to see your own name in these ending credits. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.